We're going to continue our, our, our family reunion and we're going to talk about today and the time we have. We'll probably continue it next week on uh, the last aspect of being part of the family of God and family reunion, and that is this, uh, growing the family. Because the family of God is no different than every other family out there. It wants to grow. It wants to expand. It wants to build. It wants to be something. God includes that in his design. You know, how many have ever been around a famous person? When you're around a famous person, what do you want to do? You want to take their picture? You want to show everybody? You want to get their autographs? There's something about being around famous and celebrity that we enjoy because it, 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 it makes us feel better. It makes us feel like we're a little bit more. And, uh, and how many know what I'm talking about? There's that thing, like you point out famous people and stuff. Well, listen, God, the most famous celebrity ever, the most powerful being ever, the great and mighty God, the king of kings, the celebrity of celebrities, chose to find you, chose to look for you. And he didn't look it for you at the Academy Awards. He most likely looked for you in the dark place, in the place where you might not even have wanted to be found or seen, in the hurting place the most famous, powerful being wanted to be friends with you. And rarely will a celebrity on earth even give you a picture, let alone be your friend. Yet we hunger for that. And not only did he do that, it says in Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. He came to find us and save us in our lost place. But not only that, once he finds us, he tells all the heavenlies about it. Just like we do with celebrities. You're a celebrity in heaven. You need to understand that. If you don't get anything else today, get that. That the God of all creation came to look for you in the state of your life, wherever it is. And then in Luke 15, 10, it says, In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of, angel, of the angels of God. Well, who's rejoicing? People up in heaven. Over one sinner who repents, over one person who has fallen short, gets found by God, turns, because that's what repent means. It means to change direction. Changes direction and gets found. He brags, takes some selfies, sends them up to heaven. Instagrams it to everybody and the angels and everybody's rejoicing about that over you so don't ever think that you don't have some role to play in the family of God don't ever think you don't have enough because one of the scariest words in Christianity is the word evangelism we think a couple different things one of the things sometimes we think of is, oh God, you mean I have to be a jerk? You mean I got to be that person that goes up to people and throws Jesus on them? And where are you going to go if you die tonight? Is that what it is? I don't, I don't, that's what I ran from. Or else we go to the other extreme and say, I don't have enough knowledge. I'm not holy enough. I don't know enough. I'm, I'm, I'm not enough to be able to, to take my story. You know, what's sad oftentimes for us that know the Lord is God, the greatest celebrity ever, we don't tell people about. We keep him kind of back here. He's God. And you're linked with him. And he's got a plan for you. Listen what Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 2. He said this when he was talking to his disciples one day. He says, listen, the harvest is plentiful. The harvest. 
The people I want to bring into my family and into my kingdom, it's plentiful. It's everywhere. He says this, but the workers are few. My kids who are intermixed with the harvest everywhere oftentimes don't want to work, don't want to do anything. He goes, listen, Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. He didn't say pray for the harvest. He said the workers are the issue. The workers are the issue. They aren't willing to work. And I believe part of the tricking in our minds is we think we have to be at some kind of skill level for God to use us or that it's somebody else's job to influence people to to be a blessing to their lives and we think every conversation has to be about eternal things so we're we're a little reticent of that of how, how do i do that listen that's not what it's about at all it's really about seeing the needs because every day when you go to work every day when you're around people you see hurting people you see people that are troubled and oftentimes we think god really should do something about that that person really needs to do something. That, you know, something needs to happen for that person. Or if we're self-righteous Christians, we can look at that. That is horrible. We expect people non-harvested to act like people that are harvested. We expect them to operate at some level. And you know what that does? It excuses us from having to do anything. That's why the Lord said, pray for the workers. It's the workers that are needed. The harvest is everywhere. Well, you know, the disciples are no different than us. They didn't know how to do this thing. How do we do that part of family business? See, one of the deals is you were taken into God's family. You were brought in. You were taken in. You were gifted by God. The great adventure of Christianity is finding out what's my purpose here on this planet? What, where do I fit? What's my job? And then God develops our character to match our job. And then he puts us in harvest fields. This is my harvest field. This is where I've been, you know, I've been in this for a long time. The beautiful thing is when you start to hunger for that, Christian, Christianity becomes an adventure. Now it's about where do I fit? fit see some of you in here you're just trying to get through the day you don't know where you fit you're just trying to muster through others of us here are comfortable we have found our niche and we're growing and we're continuing to man maneuver some of us are still in the early adventure of where do i fit in how do i do this and we got the pull of the old world and the pull of the new world on us and, and we're struggling with that and we think things should happen particular ways and they don't and, and we're, you know, we're all lost. We're, we're on the journey. Jesus' disciples were the same. So we're going to pick up the story today because we're, there's principles in here that God is going to give to his disciples on how to influence and help the hurting. Why? Because that's usually the first step into bringing someone into the family. When you're at work and there's somebody and Bob sitting next to you and Bob's complaining about his life, that's an opportunity to do something to help Bob. To do something. Well, the disciples were the same, so let's get a picture. These guys have been walking with Jesus for about a year now, and they've been following him around and he's been showing them this and doing that stuff and doing and he decides at one point to send the 12 out and he broke them into six groups of two so now these guys got to get along together and then they got to figure out a way one of the scriptures one of the in fact this miracle we're going to look at in the next two weeks is the only miracle 
recorded in all four Gospels. So that tells us something of importance about what God wants to get across in this situation. Well, these guys were broken up into do groups, and, the, and the, one of the Gospels says he told them to go your own way, which means they had to figure out what they were going to do, just like us. Well, okay, I got Jesus. Now, now what am I supposed to do with life? How, how do I walk this out? What, what, what to, he goes, go your own way. And these guys went, he said, go to the towns I'm going to visit. I'm sending you into these harvest fields. Simply go your own way. Figure out what to do. Go in there and tell them, hey, we got a celebrity rabbi coming. He's got, uh, he, he's got been doing amazing things. He, you know, you might want to come on Thursday. You, whatever they did, they had to figure it out. In the midst of doing this, probably was a number of weeks long, these guys were separated from Jesus. Jesus is doing his thing. He's teaching and healing and, and same thing. And these guys were given that power to do that as a testimony. Because, you see, your power, wherever you're at, is your life. That's your biggest power. That God has touched me, and I just want to help you. You don't even have to say God has touched me. If they see that you're different, that is curiosity forming in people. So, he said, go do that. Well, while they're doing it, John the Baptist gets beheaded. And they start to hear this. And one of the heroes is killed, mar martyred, actually. And then they come back to Jesus. They're tired. Life's been going on. And then the people keep coming. Lesson number one for you. Anytime you help hurting people, it's never convenient. There is never the right time. It is always you wish they didn't come right now. You wish this thing didn't happen. We were on vacation a week and a half ago, and we must have had, and Sandy's true, but we must have had, I don't know, 15 phone calls. It's okay. It's just part of life. Now it's just like, eh, it's a phone call. Do what you can. And, but life, it's never convenient. You don't get to do ministry in a clean, sterile environment. So get over that. When you've got to love somebody, you know who you're supposed to love? The person next to you, that body. And aren't they the hardest people to love? They might be working with you. So we pick up the story here. These guys coming back in the nitty-gritty of life. They meet with Jesus, and it says this in Mark chapter 6, verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. They came back. They had their meeting. They obviously had it scheduled at some point that they were going to leave. They were going to come back, and then they're meeting, and they're talking to Jesus, and they're, they're you know, having a breakdown. They're, having a, a, they're rehashing it. What's that called oftentimes? Debriefing. debriefing. They're debriefing with Jesus, and, and they're having this good time. And it says... Then, just when they wanted to have a little time alone, then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. So they traveled no man. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. That is the environment God's going to use you in. You're going to be in the busy thing of life, tired, stressed. These guys are tired. They start talking to Jesus. He says, let's get away from here. People keep coming. Why? Because Jesus has been doing miracles and doing his stuff. He's been teaching. People are coming. They're still coming. The other guys come in. They can hardly get a word in. So he says, let's go away. They jump in a boat. They travel. People on the shore. Hey, hey, hey. And they're following them. The harvest is plentiful it's always there there's always more needs than can be met at any point in time so it says when jesus landed in verse 34 and saw a large crowd he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd so he began teaching them many things 
They land the boat. Jesus gets out, and he sees these people, and he says, oh, my gosh. Compassion means I feel for their need. He says, they are like sheep that don't know what to do. One of the things we need to understand is that world out there, that harvest field, they don't know what to do. We can make fun of them. We can say all kinds of things. They're lost. They're like sheep without a shepherd. And he says, and he started to teach them. Now remember, the apostles are with him. So then we pick up the story here, and it says, by this time, the very next very all day long, by this time it was late in the e day, so the disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. See, the disciples are like you and me. They discern the needs. They said, wow, these people are hungry, man. I'm, we've been hungry. We haven't even eaten. Now we're over here. We're going another eight hours with hardly anything to eat. And we're looking around at all these clowns, and none of them have any food. Jesus. And this is the way we help Jesus. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that, but... <laughs> But this is what we do. See, we see a need, and we get logical. See, God, logic to God is like the enemy. These guys got logical. It is logical. We need to go inform Jesus. Jesus, wrap it up. It's getting late. Everybody's hungry. They got to travel miles to the store. They got to go home. These people are ill-prepared. Nobody brought food. Why? They're sheep without a shepherd. See, think of yourselves oftentimes when you've ran around as when you were in the harvest field and how ill-prepared you were. This is just a tiny little sliver of their lives. They chased this boat around the lake looking for something who knows what was all in their heart they they were looking for something they didn't even bring food and jesus looked at him and goes oh my gosh they're like sheep that don't even know where to eat because they eat everything that's the harvest out there they eat whatever they can they're 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 ill prepared so the disciples say Send them away to get help. That's logical. Totally logical. And then Jesus blows them away. You know, logic is oftentimes the greatest obstacle you and I will have to faith. We will say something, Chris mentioned it earlier, we will say that's impossible. That's not logical. And so we move faith out of there and we go with logic. That's why some of us that are in recovery relapse all the time because we don't see any logical way for my life to move forward. We don't see any logical way to change careers. We don't see it, and many of us here, some of you sitting in here today know that God wants you to do something different in career or that doesn't quite fit you and it stirs in you, and you want, but you don't think it's logical. That's not logical. Logical kills faith. So they go to Jesus and explain logically what should happen. And Jesus turns to him and he says this, verse 37, well, why don't you give them something to eat? They had already figured that out. Very next verse says, well, we got that logically covered too, Lord. They said, hey, listen, that would take eight months worth of money, wages to feed these guys. Somebody, one of the apostles, is doing math. They must have had their little meeting when Jesus was having his meeting. Because that's what we sometimes do, don't we? We have our meeting when he has his meeting. They explain, hey, Jesus, that's going to take eight months worth of words. Are we to go? Really? Are we to go and spend that kind of money on bread and give it to them to eat? See, when the Lord puts you in a situation in the harvest, you are going to feel overwhelmed. You are going to feel inadequate. That, in fact, that's one of the ways you know it's a God deal. When you go into something and you go, I got this, 
Well, then you got it. When you go, when you find yourself in there, Bob sitting next to you, and Bob starts telling you about his family stuff, and you're going, whoa, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what to say. I don't know you. That's probably a God thing. So Jesus says, you guys go feed him. They say, well, we ain't got the money for that. He says, well, Jesus looked at him. Well, how many loaves do you have? What do you possess? He said, go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. In, God, in John's gospel, he said, they were looking for what do we got, and they found some kid who brought lunch, one of the smart ones. He had five loaves and some fish. So they grab the five loaves and fish, and they bring it to Jesus and goes, well, we got. See, what you got, that's good. God knows what you got. So, when you want to help somebody that's hurting, I'm going to give you seven principles. I'll probably only give you a couple today. The first one is this. Jesus wants you to be logical. His logical is a little bit different than your logical. Jesus is no fool. So, the first step in, hurting some, in helping somebody that's hurting is this. Search out available resources. He told them, go see what you got. What do you got? Search out available resources. That was a lesson for me in my young days in, in ministry. I thought I had to be the answer to everybody's issue. If you came to me with whatever, I thought I had to figure that. That's what a lot of us trip on. Because I, I don't know what to do here. I don't know. What, get some resources. You don't have to know what to do. Hey, Bob, I'm not sure what to, how to handle that. But let me uh, get some stuff and I'll get back to you. Let me, let, me, let me see what I got. Check out what are the resources. And number two, bring what you have to Jesus. That will do. Bob, I don't know what to do. I'm looking at some things. God, help. That's why, right? See, it's, it's not about having all the right answers. Well, hold on a second. I got 32 scriptures here for you. Because I've memorized Romans. I'm ready to help people. God, just think if God had to wait for you to get all your act together before he could use you, you'd never be used. I'd never be used. What if you, I'd like to, no, 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 no. I'd like to, oh boy. I'd like to, oh, that's not going to work. You never, he uses what he's got. See, this is the thing because God is bigger. God is bigger. He's just asking you to be available to work in the harvest. He didn't say you got to know everything about the harvest. These guys were fishermen. Do you know not one of the apostles was a shepherd? Jesus is always talking about sheep, and these guys go, I don't know diddly about sheep. <laughs> How am I supposed to help them? I don't know about that. He, you don't have to know everything. You just have to be available. That ought to be a big, oh, God can use me? Yeah. And when he brings someone into your, he brings, well, basically, he brings you into whatever the harvest is, one-on-one. -on -one. It doesn't matter that they were in this particular case, 5,000. That's not the point. In fact, the miracle he's going to feed 5,000, that ain't even the big deal. He fed those 5,000, they're hungry again in seven hours. So what? He was trying to do something in his disciples, which he's trying to give it to us too. He says, listen, bring what you have to Jesus. I'm going to give you one more. It says, then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. What does that mean? Why? Three is this. Calm down. Stay composed. Set boundaries. 
Listen, if God's going to use you, you can't be panicking more than the sheep. Calm down. It's working out. Relax. Get it manageable. Set a boundary. It's going to work out. He said, tell the people to sit down in smaller groups, in manageable sizes. Take things at a bite size. See, you can apply this to yourself. Some of us in here, everything that happens, we go nuts. And that because, whoa, calm down, slow down. What do you got? Bring it to Jesus. It's going to be okay. And that's one of the reasons sometimes we freak out when people come. We, we start running around as crazy as they do. I remember one of the big lessons I learned at the mission. Invariably, homeless people would come in at 5 o'clock on Friday night telling me they don't have a place to stay. Can the mission give them money or this or that? And we're already full and this and that. And I would jump up from my desk. <laughs> They're panicking. I'm panicking. We're all panicking. And I, and I felt like it was my job to fix their my home. And, this, and then finally one of the older, wiser guys came in and said, Hey, Joe, what are you doing? I said, they ain't got home. They ain't a place to stay. It's going to be dark in a little bit. I felt like I was one of the apostles. It's like getting late. I don't know what to do. He goes, hey, dude, I'm pretty sure they knew they were not going to have a place tonight before 4.45. You think? Well, probably. Yeah. That's their issue. That's not your issue. What? But I follow Jesus. Yeah. Jesus knew they were going to be in that situation too. Calm down. Just because they're ill-prepared just because they don't get their act together doesn't mean you got to fix it. Here's what you do. He comes, he comes walking into the office. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, so you guys don't have a place to stay tonight. Yeah. What was your plan if this wasn't going to work? He's like, good point. I should write that down. He's a resource to me. He just gave me a nugget right there. What was their plan B now that we're sitting here? And what, how come you didn't deal with this like on Thursday or Wednesday? How long did you know you weren't going to have a place Friday night? See, what you can do to help somebody is not necessarily meet their express need but help them to deal with how do they get into that place in the first place. That might even be the greater help. But they see, that's a God discernment thing. And if you're going to be in the ministry of helping God's family expand for the big picture, for the length of your journey here in this harvest field, you have to learn to pace yourself. And you have to learn that just because there is a presented need, that doesn't mean everything. That doesn't mean that that need has to be met now for everything else. Maybe you help them in a different way. Maybe you get resources. Get someone that's farther down the road to give you a couple nuggets. One of the, see, when Tree says amen like that, I know what that means. <laughs> and cut. <laughs> That's a wrap. <laughs> That's what marriage gives you. Those little, those little incidents. I don't know if everybody heard her say that, but I did, and that was the important part. <laughs> so with that, We'll continue on next week, and just know this, 
Now, and here's the point for you guys. You're, you're leaving today into the harvest field. You are immediately going to get opportunity to apply what you learned this morning. Because that's the way God operates. That's how it sinks into us. Now, for some of you, you're, your own, you're in the harvest right now. And these three things I just shared with you are good for you. Some of you are going to meet people in whatever arrangement God has while you're doing life in the harvest, and you're going to get that opportunity. One is you check resources. Comes to you, what are my resources here? What can I do? What can't I do? What is, what is available to me? Bring it to God. It may be nothing. I don't even know what to say to him, Lord. Lord, help me what to say. Have you ever had that experience with God where you say, God, help me what to say? He just starts spewing wisdom out of you. You're even amazed. I can't even believe I said that. <laughs> that's good stuff. I should write that down. You know, th sometimes that's the way it operates. You don't know. What's the resources? Do I deal with it now? Do I deal with it later? How does it work? Secondly, bring it to Jesus. This is what I got. And remember, logic is not going to be your best friend here. Because you will already figure out with God once you do without even a, a bringing it to God. Bring it to God. You may say, God, God, I got nothing. He goes, well, tell him you got nothing then. Oh, okay. Or you say, I got nothing. I just got me. Oh, that's good enough. We say this. You don't know. You don't know till you do it. That's why working is a scary thing. And then the third one, calm down. It's going to work out. Right? How much, how, how has panicked ever helped you? You know, when I panicked the other day, that was a huge blessing to my life. <laughs> Worked like a charm. I need to panic more. <laughs> All right, you guys get it. Stand up. Let's do the, let's get ready. Where do we get, we can go. Dear Lord, can you repeat after me? Dear Lord, there's a big harvest field out there. I'm scared. But I got you. So when the opportunity presents itself, help me to trust you to be your hands and feet and whatever that looks like in that time. And I will trust you. I will walk in faith. And whatever you speak to me, I will do it. You guys really mean that? Oh, this should be interesting. All right. Thank you, Lord. God bless you guys. Have a great day.